From flawless keepsake animals and quilted blankets to family heirlooms and angel dolls, Keepsakes by Nicoletta creates one-of-a-kind mementos lovingly handcrafted from your most sentimental garments, making them into cherished lifelong keepsakes. Using techniques passed through generations for over a century in her family, Nicoletta breathes new life into memories that will last forever, connecting the past to the future. For timeless keepsakes, contact Nicoletta by emailing nicoletta at keepsakesbynicoletta.com.au or check out her designs on her beautiful website, keepsakesbynicoletta.com.au. Welcome to the Art of Decluttering podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Kirsty Ferugia from Feels Like Home Professional Organisers. And I'm Amy Ravel from Simply Organised. We can't wait to share with you all our tips and tricks to help you declutter and keep your home and family organised. If you'd like to engage with the podcast further, you can find us at The Art of Decluttering on Facebook. Let's get started. You've joined us for episode 55 of The Art of Decluttering. Today we'll be talking about decluttering and organising after the passing of a loved one. Okay, this episode can be really challenging to listen to. Um, you obviously can see by the title of the episode that it's on death. So we just wanted to give a quick trigger warning that if you have had a loved one pass away very recently or if you're still in the depths of grief, then you have our permission and you don't need our permission to not listen to this episode. Come back to it when things aren't so raw because it is going to be quite a heavy episode. Amy and I and Mandy cry throughout the episode. So we just wanted to give you some heads up so that you can make the decision that best suits you today and going forward. We have got the most beautiful person that Amy and I know Mandy. She is a beautiful listener and one of Amy's clients and she's also been in our course and we know from experience her heart for decluttering and her heart for you, our listeners. If you have gone through a similar experience, we know that Mandy's wisdom will be so beneficial to you and we are so looking forward to this conversation. So welcome, Mandy. Thank you for having me and I hope that some of what I've been through might help other people. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I certainly, unfortunately, have quite a lot of experience in um, dealing with, uh, I guess, frontline death, so death of a parent or a spouse um, and people close to me and... Yeah, hopefully some of what I have to say will help people who might be facing similar things. Mm. So tell us a little bit about your family and what you do and just give us like a two-minute insight into the world of Mandy. (laughs) I'm a mum of an 11-year-old boy and a 13-year-old girl who were both born in Singapore. Um, I work in corporate corporate land in communications. Um, I'm really interested in podcasting, so that's uh, another benefit of being here apart from meeting you guys. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty busy. I've got a dog and I have have had a... a beautiful dog. (laughs) My beautiful dog, Pepper. And I've um, recently moved house um, from a smaller house to a bigger house. So kind of the opposite of what you guys kind of talk about sometimes but no I think as family situations change like when we went from a family of three to a family of four we needed a bigger house so that just naturally happens as life stages change and all that kind of stuff yeah well true so my my children were born in Singapore um I was married and my husband died very suddenly so he was young it was unexpected he had a heart condition we didn't know about it was um devastating and very sudden and you know a big shock so I had to deal with um, deal with all of that and all that comes with that um, grief and um, uh, emotional side of things as well as dealing with the stuff because you were in Singapore weren't you when Dean passed away yeah so this is um, almost 10 years ago um and after after he died, we stayed on for about a year. I wasn't in a state where I could move mentally, physically, lots of 
things. I didn't want the kids to be uprooted when they'd just had such a change. And we came back to Australia and within about three years later, um, my mother died pretty suddenly again. She she had um, something that, you know, it was sudden as well. And six months later, my father died um, about... I think it was 11 days later, my stepfather died and a couple of years later, my stepmother died. So there was a lot of death, um, too much for anyone to to kind of even think about, but that's life and, um, and that's what happened. And what do you do? You soldier on and part of that soldiering on is going through the grieving process as best as you can. I kind of don't like it calling it the grieving process. It sounds like something that's kind of laid on you and I don't think it's like that. It just becomes part of your life. It's still part of my life and I guess it always will be. Um, But you try and get joy out of life and find, you know, happiness and move on to good things as much as possible. Um, Keeping good things from the past that you've had with those loved ones um do you have do you have any (laughs) brothers and sisters did you have anybody else helping you with your parents and your um step parents yes um and I, I do I have a brother and a sister I had um my father's wife had two daughters um or has how do you yeah how do you say she still has two two daughters she has two daughters um uh, with my husband, he obviously had a, um, a family too. He's, he's sort of original family of origin. So um, they, all these people come into the picture. And I suppose with these, with with any death, it's different for everyone and every situation is different. And what comes into play, um, you know, emotionally, politically, um, on so many levels will be different with each story. So with my husband, when he died, I made a very conscious decision to straight away go into his things and it felt incredibly frightening and I needed a lot of courage. Mm. And it, it was a brave thing to do. I had to... I had to go to his cupboard and get his clothes for his funeral. Mm. And I had to do that for my mum too. And it's a really, really hard thing to do. And that's perhaps one of the first things people need to do. And it's a step in the process of letting go of things associated with that person. Um, You know, I chose one of his most beautiful suits and he was a very well-dressed man and liked his liked his nice things, his nice clothes, his nice shoes and so on. So even that, I remember making the decision, oh, should I get rid of one that's not, you know, not going to be saved for um, our son or do I give him the most, you know, beautiful outfit I can, which is what I chose in the end. Because that Um, was most fitting with Dean. Yeah. 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 Um, He was someone who liked... um, fine things so he had nice cufflinks for example so I saved a few of the things that I thought would be nice for our children um, things that I particularly had an attachment to because maybe I'd given it to him for a wedding anniversary or birthday or something so a special pen or a nice watch those sort of things Um, but with the cufflinks he had so many cufflinks that I decided at the wake and following those days following I would give them and his very beautiful ties he had many ties to close friends Mm. so I'm sort of skipping around a bit but I think I let the family his family his brother and father um, choose what they wanted and his sister took some of his art because he painted Um, so once the family had kind of chosen what they wanted I felt and I feel very much that friends are sometimes a huge role in people's lives, sometimes closer than immediate family, often closer than immediate family, and they can be very affected by things too. So a small gesture like, would you like this tie, can be enormous for them and their grief. And now I watch some of his friends over the years have 
worn his cufflinks or his ties, and they've said to me, "I'm wearing, <laughs> I'm wearing um, Dean's tie. It makes me feel good." Or I gave his um, racing bike to a friend that he rode bikes with, and it was a fairly new racing bike, and it had cost a lot of money. And I thought, oh, he'd love, he'd love Will to have this, and. Um, I don't know some of some things like that that he would he would associate with his friends. When my mother died, she had this scarf collection like you've never seen anything like it. She had hundreds of scarves, so my sister and I took scarves that we wanted, and probably sister-in-law and a couple of you know nieces and so on. But um, it was something I took to the funeral in a basket, to the wake in a basket um, with my sister and we said to her girlfriends that were very close to us, we said, we'd like you to take one of mum's scarves and they wear them. So the scarves, the cufflinks, the ties, they're out there and they're being given new life and they have um, sentimentality and an attachment to them that brings people maybe some, I don't know, nice thoughts about that person. Oh, Mandy. I can't even so Kirsty and I are standing here crying <laughs> because I love the, the way that you've honoured in that and you've – it's not just about the possessions and it's part of the memory. It is. And I, I thought about this um, before I came in that my grandma, who I was really close to, she died when I was in my early 20s, but we had always cooked together and cooking was a huge part of our – relationship. We baked this um, family recipe of a birthday cake that's only made on family birthdays in our family. And um, when she died, I remember dad saying to me, take what you want from the apartment. And I knew all I wanted was the cooking things. And um, to this day, I still use the same baking tray and the same. um, I used the Kenwood Chef for many years and then that that carked it. But um, (laughs) I I have the baking tray and the... um, the wire rack still. And so when I make this birthday cake, it feels very much a labour of love and a connection to my grandma. And I think when you're decluttering after death, choosing things that have real meaning is what it's all about. The rest of it... Your your grandma's um, wire cooling rack was yeah. probably not the most expensive item she owned. No, I'm sure and she had, you know, she had jewels and stuff right. like that, that. But that didn't mean didn't as much to you. No. In fact, what she did have was um, she was an immigrant from Hungary and she had somehow, I don't know how, but she had come uh, on a boat to Australia after the war with this very beautiful crockery set. And it was a huge crockery set. And on my 40th birthday, Dad had said to me, you can have Grandma's crockery set, but you have to keep it in one piece. And you and I have talked about this, Amy, when you've seen this massive crockery set, can I just have a little bit of it? I'm like, I can't because I made this promise to Dad and it's honouring this woman who, I mean, imagine with a small child and you're travelling away from a war-torn country and moving to a new place and you feel that bringing your crockery set, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with her dignity or mm. there was some importance there that I now um, honour as well. Um, anyway, I am jumping around a bit. so It's all good, lovely. I've got a question just because I don't yeah. know your story and I wonder if listeners... Yeah. So you can choose not to answer it. It's totally fine. Did you have the funeral for Dean in Australia or did you have it in Singapore? We, uh, this is kind of, it's a little bit morbid. So Singapore is hot and humid. Yes. Um, Dean wouldn't have wanted anyone sort of touching him or messing with him. And they had said to me he will need to be embalmed if um, he isn't cremated quickly. Mm -hmm. So... He was cremated within 24 hours, which is, um, yeah, heavy because we had to get an autopsy done because when a young person dies, it's, you know, people want answers. Um, So we had one there and then we had a, I guess, like a memorial a few days later in Singapore with many, many people, I don't know, hundreds 
hundreds of people. Wow. When a young person dies and someone who's, um, you know, so well liked and well loved at work, at home, with friends and so on, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and then his family felt very strongly that we come home and do something at home for the family and friends who couldn't get to Singapore. Yeah. Um, so we also did one where he had been captain of the cricket club and um, we had one there with, I don't know, hundreds of people. I can't even remember how many. Hundreds. Huge, big marquee and... I don't know, party pies and sausage rolls were his thing. So we we had something oh. there as well. Um, yeah. Because the reason I ask is because I was like, oh, did you have to bring his cufflinks and stuff to Australia or did they, they go to your, your expat friends in Singapore? Um, both. I um, had given some away there and suits. He had beautiful suits and ties, as I said. Um, so his immediate family had... Um, come over and I then also kept some stuff and that all came back with our what we shipped home um, and I remember when I arrived back home and there were the boxes arrived and there were 247 boxes I mean wow that's a lot it was full for on. an overwhelm an already overwhelming situation and he had been married and divorced before we had met um or married before we met and split up and then later on divorced. But he had boxes from his previous marriage um, as well, which kind of came out of storage. So there were, talk about overwhelm, it kind of was like, whoa. So I kind of picked through a bit and got stuff I thought the kids might want, a few things that mattered to me, which was not much by then because you just are like, oh, well, none of this matters when mm. this sort of tragedy happens. Um, and then I got the sort of next next sort of level of family friends and just brought them around and said, get what you want. If it's a pair of his old runners that your son can wear and thinks of him when he wears them, that's great. So a lot went that way. Um, I donated a lot. I've kept some and then culled down, you know, for example, suits. Mm. I actually said to my son, we've got a lot of suits. When we moved house recently, I said, how about you choose what you think? And it's a lot to put on an 11-year-old, but he's incredibly um, emotionally intelligent and mature for his age in these sort of matters. Um, you know, growing up with a single mother, you sort of learn to discuss big issues I suppose or me with me anyway um and he was so sensitive and beautiful the way he chose he said I think I just need one or two mum and he did um and I you know I still have too many I've probably still what did you do with the ones that he decided not to keep for himself um I think four or five I gave to um people where it fit where it would fit them um and in fact, some I'd given to dad. So they came back to me because after dad died, they came back to me. And yeah. it's like, oh, there's too many. So I know we had spoken about you can give them to people looking for jobs. And so I spoke to my son about that. And I said, this is where they'll go. And he really liked that idea. And I said, your dad would have liked that. He was definitely a generous and mm. charitable person. So, um, yeah, that's... Most of it went like that. But some things, like a cap or a T-shirt, mean much more to me than a Xenia suit or something like that. So, And accessories or his art or things like that. I've also, you know, my daughter, she may want something someday. But as they grow up and they tell me what matters and what doesn't, and things that I think will be important to them or relevant to them aren't necessarily. And so I have to be careful not to put too much of my own stuff on them mm. my own you know I'm thinking emotional stuff on them um that's really interesting that because your kids were so little like they were one and three were or two, one and, two and three yeah. two and three like um that's a long time to carry stuff around for them yes. like it's it's and I just think that you're amazing. Like, what are they, like, overwhelming? I'm going to cry. I can't talk today. Yeah. Look, I try to incorporate some of it in our lives now. 
and that's partly what I've learned from you guys. So his watches, I started thinking, well, that's a beautiful watch. Mm. I'll wear it sometimes. So I got things fixed. Um, there were a couple of beautiful watches that weren't working or a pen that had run out of ink. So I use them and I'm mindful when I use them that that is him. I part noticed, of him. It's not him. It's a part yeah, of him. We understand. I noticed when you um, arrived today that the hanky that you were holding, I knew exactly what it was yeah. because I'd helped you curate that. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, just that kind of thing, bringing a hanky that reminds you. He, he of... has hankies. <laughs> he had hankies. Um, and I kept a few. Um I don't Hank think I've told I don't think I've told anyone this, but when I go to like a school play or and last night I had my son's school performance, I take it. Beautiful. Or I might wear my grandma's scarf or my mum's I don't know, um mum's earrings or so, something that brings them a little along a bit. And and that's probably to comfort me as much as anything else. But a hanky's a great and a scarf's a great thing for that because it's not cumbersome. That's you right. You can have it in your pocket or in your handbag. But it is so special. Yeah. And is that comfort? It is. It is. I, I sometimes think um, I'm a bit too sentimental and I've held on to too much. But things like that I think are a really good thing to hold on to. So if you have the choice to hold on to smaller things that don't add a, a, an, a another, you know, literal layer of heaviness, maybe that's how you can help declutter. I, I do believe, in a, and the reason I brought up is finding out that, uh, choosing their funeral clothes is that's the first step in the decluttering. More from us in just a few minutes. Don't forget to visit our website, theartofdecluttering.com.au and sign up for our bonus episode that is not so secret anymore. We've done episodes on linen cupboards, sentimental items, media, baby supplies, donations, weddings and so many more. So if you're new to the art of decluttering, you'll find loads of great tips like this one from the episode we did on crafts and hobbies. What I'm saying is the kind of supplies we used to make jewellery back then is completely different to the type of jewellery people wear now. Yes. And so you can still have the same hobby, but the products that you use could completely evolve over time. Yes. And so that's why it's really good to ask, is this still me? And, and equally so, is this still a passion of mine? Like, am I still passionate about this hobby? And now back to the podcast for so many more tips and tricks. Suddenly people can place enormous attachment onto things. And I know, for example, when my father died, because he had a wife who, you know, more or less kept everything, um, we didn't sort of take much. It was left to her and that's how he would have wanted it and we honoured that. But when she died... Suddenly, you know, a few years have gone by and things become more like, oh, well, you know, people can, and you've got step families involved, that can be very contentious. Um, and it's a really, really hard time for many families, I think, even if you're a close family. Um, one thing we did, and I was, I was thinking, I'm jumping around again, sorry. It's all good. Jumping around is totally fine because that's... Oh, listen, all our podcasts jump around, let's be honest, because yeah. you and I are never lineal in the way that we okay. think or talk. <laughs> okay, well, a very practical thing that I believe helps through um, a process where you're decluttering from, say, your parents and you've got siblings involved. Our um, parents' generation, many of them were born in Depression era. There's a lot of hoarders in that generation, and my mother particularly was, um, you know, probably... Uh, Borderline hoarderish, you know. Let's say, let's be truthful. Yes. She was pretty. She was pretty much someone who likes to hold on to a lot of stuff. And um, going through her things was tough because she was sentimental and had held things from her parents' generation and and theirs. So we had, you know, family history, photos and books and I don't know statues and stuff from. And your mum was an artist. As, she like was a, a photographer. photographer. And she had kept every single photo she'd ever taken. So she had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, like thousands of photos. And, you know, we each chose some. Each cho each kid chose some. Um, and then I still have some. And I think we've agreed that they will be donated to um, a photography gallery. She has stuff in the National Gallery. She's and very well known. Beautiful. Back in her day, art. she was. Yeah. But 
And then even choosing them, it's sort of like, oh, that's too much. It can be too much. So you have to be mindful of how you sort of hand things out. And she luckily had handed things out too. And she was someone who could talk about death quite matter of factly like, oh, now when I go, I want you to have this and I want this to go there. You know, so she'd written letters and, you know, there's a whole legal minefield too because, of course, the estate owns everything when oh. someone dies. And if you want your wishes to be honoured and, you know, the girls get the jewellery, for example, and um, this one, this piece of art goes to that one, that all has to be set up in advance. Most people don't do it. They might say it or they might write a letter, which if people are getting on, might stand up. If not, it might not. So you got to be careful about how you deal with it. So we chose as siblings with mum stuff, we each got a different colour sticker, like a little round sticker from the newsagent. And we went around the house and put our stickers on what we thought we wanted. And then the next person went around and put it on. And we had an agreement that it didn't matter if someone else had a sticker already, you were allowed to put it on. And then at the end, you'd negotiate. So it wasn't about monetary value. It was about that meant something to me because of this. Or I had this conversation with mum where she said, oh, I'd really love you to have that. Or I'd said, I'd really like that when you go, when the time comes. Some people might find that really morbid and not have that conversation, such as my We've dad. We've had that conversation in our yeah. family already. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas my dad, you, not in a million years could you have talked about that, even though he was um, sick and dying and at the end it was very clear that this was coming. Um, he didn't want to talk about that. And so you respect that. And, you know, that comes with its own complexities too. But, I mean, my my view would be talk about it. It's much better. And if you have the relationship with your family that you can talk about this stuff, go and talk about it. Mm. You know, obviously in a sensitive way, not waiting for them to pop off so you can get their crystal vase or whatever it is that you're after. But, um, you know, I think things that matter. I've said to my children, the jewellery goes down the female line because I don't want any anyone getting these things if there's a divorce or whatever. But um, I don't know. I think these are these are tricky topics for anyone, aren't they? They really are. <laughs> we are so grateful that you're sharing your experience because Kirsty and I have never lost a partner nor a parent. Good. So yes, we we haven't personally walked it, though we walk it with clients very yeah. regularly. Um. So I was going to ask you, what were some of the fears? Did any fears get raised when you were decluttering by yourself and then when you were decluttering with Amy? Yeah, of course. So um, fears of holding on too much, that was probably a bigger fear than letting go. It's like, oh, my God, if I can't, if I can't let go, I'll drown in stuff. And especially with mums, there was so much stuff. There's also a time limit because you, for us, we had to sell her property. Um, and especially if others are involved, then there's a time factor to contend with usually. Um, you know, you, you also think, oh, what if I let go of something that I shouldn't? What if the kids say to me, why didn't you keep this? But, you know, as the years have gone by, I don't think that's what it's about and what all this death so much death um has taught me is the stuff just isn't that important and so Mm. it has made me much more mindful about what I bring in to my life um you know I think I said to you Amy that perishables are the only perishables are experiences so you know soap candles um holidays holidays um you know outings concerts these are the things the memories yeah but I'm equal parts um you know practical and pragmatic as I am um sentimental so uh, it's an in an inward conflict Mm. that happens and um I would like to get to the next deeper level of decluttering of my stuff um we I call it the Mandy deep dive so Mandy came up with the terminology the deep dive so it's like you, you know when you go through say your wardrobe and you declutter and then you look at it and you think actually I reckon I can go another four pieces so yeah. Mandy coined that the deep dive when we were working together and I use it all the time Mandy and I call it the Mandy deep dive oh, I don't I wish I could deep dive a lot more like yeah I mean it, it's hard it's funny my daughter is quite minimalist 
And I wonder how much of it's rubbed off on her, this feeling that stuff isn't as important. I don't know if she'd agree with that, but I I observe that Mm. in her. So I was going to ask you, Mandy, what would be your advice to people as to how they declutter? I know everybody is unique and every family and every situation and the death of people is unique. But if somebody, God forbid, had a very similar experience to you where they had very little kids, their husband died suddenly or their wife died suddenly, what would be, on reflection, what would be your advice to them? Do they do... um, How gentle do they be with themselves and how quickly do they process their stuff? Because it's obviously been 10 years for you and you're still going. Yeah. Um, If you had your time again, would you do things differently or how would you advise somebody else? Um, I've got a few friends who unfortunately are also, you know, relatively young widows and We've all dealt with it quite differently. So one of my girlfriends has not even opened the cupboard of her husband's stuff. And, you know, that's her choice. So there's no right, there's no No. wrong. And I think whatever you choose is actually the right. Um, I think, you know, most people will do what they feel is the way to do it in honour of that person. So for me... I know, especially that first month, every decision I made, I would think, I would consult him in my Mm. head. What would he say? What would he feel? What would he think? Every decision I made. So Mm. I had felt really against going home for the third funeral in about the space of a week. I didn't want to leave my children who had to leave in Singapore. I thought, I don't want to do this. It's too soon. It's too much of an upheaval. But the decision I made to go was as a result of thinking, what would he do? He'd say, just do it because there's people at home who are hurting and this is this is for them. Mm. And it wasn't putting my children first, which was against my Instinct. gut. Yeah. But it was putting what I thought he would do first. Wow. So that would that would be the one thing I I questioned, um, but I, it was so important to his family, and I knew that he would have said to me, just you know, for them, and Mum stayed with my kids, so they were okay. But um, that's that's the hard bit. Um, what would I say? I'd say that, of course, go gently with yourself, forgive yourself if you think you've done the wrong thing or thrown the wrong thing out or kept too much or whatever, but. I think you, if you use it as part of the grieving, if you can, you know, for example, take some time off work um, to spend time sitting there crying or laughing as you go through and touch the objects of that person. Also, you know, there, there are times where I would just laugh and look at mum's stuff and think, oh my God, I cannot believe she's kept this. And just because it was hers, I do not have to keep it. So mm. that's that's a big one. I think um, probably saying to yourself, if I could only keep five things, what would they be? You know, it's really not always question. the smallest thing. So mm. if, with grandmas, you know, this big Kenwood chef, big mix master thing. Um, and with your grandmas, the whole crockery set. The crockery set. Well, that mm. was that came a bit later. That came, you know, twenty years later almost. Um, but yeah, some mm. of the big stuff. You know, some people to be a house. They want yeah. they want to stay in the house that that, that person had. And, um, there's no right or wrong. And I think if you can if you can use it to the benefit of your own grief as a way to um, reflect and heal and cry and get some of the emotion out, because a lot of people will want to bottle it all in. Uh-huh. That for me, facing into it helped, but. You know, my friend who didn't go in the cupboard, maybe she's got completely different advice and would deal with it in a different way. I've got quite a few clients who have had um, siblings pass away at quite young ages and have ended up with everything because the parents weren't in the space. You know, it's it's so wrong that a parent would have be superseded. You know, like it just... It's not the way human life is meant to be, right? And so a sibling will take everything but then not know what to do with it for 20 years. Any advice on what to do when you're the one that ends up with the bulk of stuff, you know, 
share with us on that? Uh, I guess like you guys have always spoken about, you you look at it and what means something to you, keep it, and what you use, keep it. Um, but just let go. And in, in fact, by looking at uh, when when you're going through deep grief or shock of that, you, maybe you're not making the clearest decisions. But it's okay. It's just stuff in the end. And I think you can, you know, for me, it's made me very focused on what's important, on what matters in my life. I work part-time very consciously um, because I know that's not the most important thing in my life. My relationships with my children and mm. my closest family and friends, thats that matters more than everything. Um, this is not to say I'm a minimalist because I'm certainly not a minimalist and... Um, you know, but but I think things things just don't play as much of a role. I, I actually you often have perspective. Maybe. I think you do. <laughs> You're very wise. <laughs> you certainly do have wisdom and perspective. So Mandy, when it came to Dean, was there something that was easy to let go of? Uh, anything of his I didn't like that I would have decluttered if he were around. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that, that was that That's was great. easy. That um, t-shirt that you really were annoyed by just that, goes. Oh, there's some, just you know the lycra bike stuff, which I actually gave <laughs> to a lovely friend of mine who I I said, oh, you go for it, wear it while you go cycling. Yeah. <laughs> Men, a, men, men in um, lycra, middle-aged men in lycra, it's not a good thing. <laughs> I, I am married to a mammal. A mammal. <laughs> oh, not, not good. <laughs> was there something that, um, so that was the easy things, is things that you went, I, I, I wouldn't have kept this by choice anyway. Was there something that was particularly difficult, but that you let go of anyway? Um, I, I think... Actually, he was doing a PhD and my father, who was an academic and, you know, highly learned man, and um, that was their kind of connection, he and Dean, um, he said to me, never throw out his PhD notes. Your children need to know what he's like, blah, blah, blah. And his books, he had an enormous book collection. Um, mm. That was tough. That was, that was very hard because I knew that he wouldn't, you know, I also had the layer of my father saying, "Don't, don't get rid of this." So that was his his so emotional that stuff, was though. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I did that with with you actually, or mm. just when I was listening to your podcast, mm -hmm. um, that gave me permission to do that. And yeah, that was tough. I think, you know, think things that I knew he loved, but were not not practical in my life. That was tough, um, and there will always be things that I think, oh, should I have kept that? But not, I don't, I don't sort of focus on that much. Is there one thing that you have regretted, or is there anything that you have regretted letting go of? Hmm. Um. No. No. Hmm. Nothing with with either of them, um, well, with any of them, with any of them, I can't think of anything I regret letting go of, because the person is the main mm. letting go of that you have to do on some level. I mean, you keep them with you as well, but um, so everything else is insignificant compared to that. So, and so you decluttered with Amy last year. You got Amy in to help you declutter. Um, I'm just wondering how your children felt about that situation now that they're older and they're much more aware. Of like yeah. They're not two and three. <laughs> yeah, we were we were like a force, weren't we? We were, we're like a, a force machine. to be reckoned with. <laughs> we were on it. You were yeah. on a mission. Yeah, we were. How did they feel about it? They absolutely loved it um, and the result, you know, of a lighter place. They loved it. I think they would like that to happen all over again, you know, with um, blending families of late um, and a whole level of new new kind of um, layer of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think they they loved it. You know, it was it was very positive. I think giving 
for for my son, he gave away a lot of his stuff in a kind of in a garage sale. Not much was selling, you know, dollar here, dollar there, as garage sales do. Yeah, and then a a, a man came along and bought a few things and we got talking and he said he had five kids and he obviously didn't he didn't look like someone who was well off and I said you know what have the lot and he said oh no I can't afford that I said just have it and he said oh well, I've got to pay and I said don't worry about it and he so he gave my son five dollars to I don't know buy a ball or whatever but my son really kind of struggled with that for a while and I said you know what this guy had five kids and He's going to go home and each of those kids is now going to have new stuff because of what you've mm. done. And then he felt better. So, I don't know. I think I think they realise that giving, giving up stuff is just part of what you do. And, you know, I suppose with kids because they grow out of stuff, it's much more part of their, not necessarily day-to-day, but their month-to-month. Mm. You're an amazing mum, Mandy. You are an incredible mum to have been through such trauma and then brought up these such well-balanced, beautiful, generous children. Don't know that they'd always agree with me, but anyway. Oh, look, our kids will never always agree with us on any of that. But, you know, knowing you and knowing the kids, I just just want to say good job. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay, so, Mandy, you said that you had... A blended families growing up as well. You had, you've got step sisters and brothers or step siblings. Yep. How did that go divvying up and dealing with your loss of your parents? Um, first thing to say about that, it was obviously difficult, but um, if you don't, if you're not close, so you don't really get along or there's um, some. History. Fractions and yes. so on. Uh, fractiousness. Um, I think, you know, at all times you're trying to do what you think the person you love who's gone would want. So as much as possible, I know my siblings and I would focus on what would they have wanted. Or the the problem was that sometimes we'd had conversations with, mm. in this case, our dad who'd said he wanted X, Y, Z, but that's not what his wife was aware of so um it it is a very hard um hard stage for anyone going through that and it you have so much anger involved sometimes or you might have um, anger and grief and disbelief and Mm. shocks come out in in wills or in these situations with family when you're going through um, grief or trauma can be it can bring out it can bring out the best in people really it can um, but it can also bring out a fairly the horrible worst. side yeah. yeah especially where money's involved it can be quite um, contentious to say the least so for me I had to get quite philosophical and just say it's just stuff um, or okay what really matters here so my dad was um, had a farm and made olive oil and wine. So to me, getting some olive oil and wine mattered. That's what mattered to him. Um, You know, books that I knew he'd want me to have, she had given to her daughters because she probably thought he'd want her to have them. Yeah. So I think being prepared for it to have a horrible side might help people... Go into it not so unawares. That, and, and if you can have, like I said before, if you can have conversations now and get it in the open, great. If you're lucky enough to have that kind of dynamic in your family, um, you know, going the legal route's another thing where you've got things properly documented with lawyers, but most people won't do that. So it is a negotiation. And if you can think in a way that what really matters here it'll probably give you a lot of ease, a lot more ease. You won't be focused on, well, I want that dining chair. You'll be thinking, I don't know, well, you're not thinking about that. Mm. The, the memory is what yeah. matters or the, the the experience that you had with that person or the voice that they are in your head right now. Mm. That's, that's more important. 
And how did it go when she passed away? Did you just deal with your dad's stuff? Like, did her children get involved and just say, just come and get your dad's stuff? Or was it no, you were it was dealing with her stuff? Yeah, they would, they'd been married for, you know, 30 odd years and um, their stuff was combined. So mm. it was tough. And I was glad I was not executor that time. So my brother and her daughter, um, her oldest daughter were. One daughter was overseas. Um, we'd just, you know, come off the back of too much trauma of our own with our own family. So it's like, oh, my God, here we go again. Mm. Um, so I, I think it was, it was tough. Yeah. It wasn't easy and it you have to think, is it worth damaging a relationship that's good? But if there's no relationship or not a good relationship – then that that creates another dynamic. Mm. There's so less to lose. I think when it comes to decluttering with death, you have to understand so much of it is about the emotional tie mm. and it's more emotionally involved than probably any other kind of decluttering, and perhaps divorce, I mean. Um, but but with death, there's a finality that... Well, divorce, divorce is a type of death, though, isn't it? It yeah. is. It's a and divorce a has very different emotions, though, at least for decluttering, the emotions associated are very different to death. I have found. I, I think I think you're probably right, mm. but I don't. I haven't been divorced, so yeah. I hope that um, people who have to declutter through uh, grief and um, after a death, or even before death, like if you know someone's about to die and they're in a home or in hospital, or you know, you might have already started. Um, you you kind of hope that they will just go gently on themselves and say, you know, there's not really any major mistake here. You'll mm. be right. You'll get way, through it. it. It's just stuff in the end. And you know what? If you if you let go of something that you think later, oh, I shouldn't have. Just hold it in your memory or your heart and. Um, at the end, it's all just stuff. And when they've gone, if they were real, uh, I think if you're really into, say, collecting something, hand it out to the friends and family and let them give new life to it and let them get um, some some pleasure from it. That has been my absolute key takeaway from this conversation, yes. Mandy. Like, you have such a beautiful heart and such a generous heart. I'm going to cry again. <laughs> Everybody's sick of me crying. But I think that that's such a beautiful way of um, honouring the person who's passed away mm. and honouring the relationships that they have with other people and not holding it all on for yourself and not thinking that everything belongs to you and that that relationship is the most important relationship, even though it is or even though it could be. Like that they st honouring other people is yeah. beautiful and I think... You've done an amazing job of being able to uh, love the people in your life and <laughs> I can't stop crying <laughs> and um, letting go of the people in your life too and still being able to hold on to them by holding, having their hankies when you come <laughs> in to talk to us and being able to give out so much of their stuff. So thank you so much for coming in. And Amy, you have to start talking so I can stop to crying. Uh, There's not much else to say, Mandy, than thank you. Uh, I hope it's given some ha practical help to people and maybe some comfort. And Definitely. Um, you know, I, I mean, it just when you give stuff to others that belong to your, your loved one, you, you do actually get back because they... Often, you know, people will say to me, oh, I wore that today. And it might be years later and you think, oh, that's so nice. Or mm. tell my kids that later as the years go by. Yeah. Or, you know, there's that too. And there's just that it's like the memory is forever with the people that you've sent those things out to. I love it. Mandy, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I hope that, um, you know, people who are having a hard time 
are okay. <laughs> yeah, and um, we do want to say that if you are going through a really stressful time or a time of really high grief, you can contact Lifeline. And um, there are plenty of other places out there too if you feel like you're not coping. Obviously, you can get in touch with Kirsty and I, but we want to support you and make sure that um, you have those around you to travel this with as well. Thanks for joining us. If you've learned something awesome today, do a friend a favour and share this episode so they too can learn the art of decluttering. You can find me, Amy, over at simplyorganised.net or on Facebook as Simply Organised PO. You can find me, Kirsty, over at feelslikehome.net.au or on Facebook as Feels Like Home PO. Don't forget, you can see the show notes in your podcast app or over at our website, theartofdecluttering.com.au. So if there's anything you want more info on, check it out there. If you love what you hear, we'd really appreciate you leaving a review on iTunes. We hope you've enjoyed listening and that you've learned some tips to help you declutter and keep your home organised. If you'd like to join our supporter community, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash decluttering. We hope you have a great rest of your day and enjoy the freedom. From flawless keepsake animals and quilted blankets to family heirlooms and angel dolls, Keepsakes by Nicoletta creates one-of-a-kind mementos lovingly handcrafted from your most sentimental garments, making them into cherished lifelong keepsakes. Using techniques passed through generations for over a century in her family, Nicoletta breathes new life into memories that will last forever, connecting the past to the future. For timeless keepsakes, contact Nicoletta by emailing nicoletta at keepsakesbynicoletta.com.au or check out her designs on her beautiful website, keepsakesbynicoletta.com.au.